whether mother work is something that politicians are considering paying for right now. And the separate second part of the question is how would we pay for, for mothers uh, out of what, you know, where, f where from the budget the pay would come from. So, so the first part of your question, um, there, is no, there is no dignified pay for motherhood being discussed. It's only being discussed as a sort of charity or, you know, let's say glorified welfare, right? So let's say single mothers or uh, mothers in couples that may below, uh, make below like a substandard poverty, you know, wage sort of thing, get help. And most of the pro programs and initiatives that have been proposed and a couple, you know, were actually uh, taken up by the Democrats as a, as a response to the pandemic, were always emphasizing work, I guess mostly by the father or either one, because the, it was in the form of like tax benefits. So um, those families or mothers would get a tax benefit and if they were making below the poverty line, they would get some sort of like help or they would get money to pay for the children who are going hungry, right? So it's a totally different concept because the, my idea is that motherhood is work and gets paid a totally dignified salary, not even a livable salary, the equivalent salary of all other essential jobs in society, and it gets treated with the same respect because money in our society confers respect. So if someone knows that you're making 2,600 bucks a month, which I think is like a fair amount, right? And you have put down a down payment and you have a house that you pay in the mortgage for and whatever else, right? Um, that gets those mothers a respect that they don't get, receive now in our society. Um, I, I think that recognizing motherhood as highly skilled work, difficult work, um, uh, important as, you know, work at the level of like people who join the, you know, the, the army or the defense corps or, uh, you know, firefighters or whatnot, that's a very important part of it. And it also comes with a mandatory education, um, which I think is, is, is fundamental to give mothers skills, more skills to join the workplace after they, let's say, graduate from the main years uh, of motherhood. Um, so yeah, I think that where, where from the budget this would come is, is kind of still uh, an optional answer. Um, there are all kinds of ways. Um, my vision for it is that there will be, uh, there can be an optional payroll, so tax. So um, men and women can choose where when they work to have a certain amount of income taken out withheld from their pay that goes to the UMI program. Uh, by being optional, you don't have all the usual complaints of people who don't want any, you know, any taxes, any more taxes. And I think that in exchange, you know, these contributors will get a UMI card. So you could be someone who contributes to the future generations. You can be someone who contributes to the independence of mothers. It can also, in time, uh, give you the moral excuse to not have children of your own, whether a mother or a father, who for many reasons you don't want to have children of your own, where at least you're paying into the mother income. Um, it, it can also have be an equivalent of supporting mother nature, right? Because the mothers are going to be uh, educated on natural skills that we have launched. So that's part of the, my vision of like the necessary education, which now you, know, you can find through like coaches or doulas or whatever. Um, there can also be, of course, you know, huge uh, donations in the form of like uh, foundational money, um, as well as crypto. I've thought at length <laughs> and in depth about you know, what happened to the you know, cryptocurrency initiatives 
and I believe that a, a, a very good use for a lot of them would be to like funnel them toward paying for mothers, mother work, um, because then it would become currency. It would become currency without necessarily uh, becoming the currency that belongs to the whales, right? Or the rich who kind of like hack the system. So it, it can meet its original, more uh, socially minded and more idealistic, uh, you know, uh, drive, which is, you know, why really, you know, cryptocurrencies were created. Um, but there are many different, you know, suggestions I have um, where this money can come from. There could be a corporate tax, or at least a tax on corporations who, you know, which make money off mothers and children. Um, there are all kinds of, of ideas, and I think that the important thing is to uh, remember that even though it will only begin as a, you know, limited program that then becomes expanded to a national program, the idea is that it should be an international program. Because it is really how we might overcome nationalist the borders and, and uh, ideologies that pit us against each other, right, at war. We're not gonna overcome them uh, through trade, multinational trade, and you know, the rich getting richer at the expense of everyone else. But we might overcome them if all mothers you know, who are like the first step to the next generation are paid equally, are made equal, um, and are educated in, in these basic fundamental ways the same worldwide. I mean, that is a revolutionary um, kind of like reprogramming possibility for the 21st century that would get us to the end of this millennium looking very different than we were at the beginning of this millennium. Uh, and it changes our relationship to privatized wealth, right? So, and, and I think it also shifts a little the power, uh, you know, inequity between like developed and less developed nations. Is this something that is being practiced in other countries? Not that I know of, it's not practiced anywhere that I know of. Again, there are like it's small initiatives, government initiatives where like single moms get stipends, people who have uh, uh, you know children or more than one child get stipends, that sort of thing. But it's never like work. It's never the equivalent of a salary mm -hmm. and with the benefits and the pension and this whole idea of being and you know of, of having employment. Right, mothering is a job. And while you're a mother, you don't have to do other work because you're fully paid. What about single fathers? Yeah, that, I mean, again, you know, single fathers to me is, a, is kind of like a, a delicate subject. So, of course, the guardian, right, the legal guardian of the child takes over. Uh, so, that, you know, that goes without saying. Something happens to a mother who's already enrolled. Right, so it's an optional program the way I see it. So mothers who want it would have to sign up for it. So it's not in any way obligatory. You don't have to have it. Um, the 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 issue with like the fathers is that fathers do not have give birth. Right. So um, I I think that it's an it's an awkward it's an awkward situation because you don't want fathers to get that away from mothers especially in less developed countries. Because um, in order for fathers to have the children from the beginning, they have to, I guess, hire a surrogate or, 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 you know, or, or adopt or you know, find. So it's kind of like more of a exception, right, than the rule. If it were to become the rule, it wouldn't work the same way because this is a remedy for what has gone on for five, six, 7,000 years which we've come out of, but we can't quite find our new balance because there is so much of those leftover, um, you know, patriarchal kind of tropes that we live with. So we need a generation or two of change. The generation of change is children who are not born in the same conditions and understand the world uh, completely differently, right? 
So when a child looks at the mother as, let's say, the householder or you know, the, the, the main provider, that already shifts a lot of our you know, pre-understood concepts of value or, you know, in, our, in our culture. So that's why I think that to begin with, the benefit to fathers is more that fathers no longer have to pay for mothers to have their children, right? Uh, or, for, or for the children to be raised, but it's less that fathers will be the direct um, you know, recipients um, in the sense that it would then by default go to well-off fathers. I mean, you have to have enough money to either pay a surrogate or you know, adopt a child or you know, go through that whole process. So yeah, I, I, I'm not ready to commit to that yet. <laughs> Yeah, again, I don't know that. I do know that trans men, of course, will qualify, right, in full, uh, because a trans man can give birth. So, oh, you know, trans men qualify. That makes no difference. Now, a trans woman who cannot actually, you know, give birth, conceive and give birth, I think is, again, you know, kind of like the same, similarly problematic, because um, it, it intrudes in, in that kind of like flawless, you know, it, in, it intrudes in that flawless evolution that this shift imagines, right? Yeah, where like the mother is no longer dependent. And, and so the two, you know, in, in my ideal, in my vision, new families can be created where, you know, fathers and mothers can be united without thinking about who pays for what and who supports whom, right? Um, yeah. So I don't really have a place for that. Yeah. What are the uh, other topics? What was the next topic you had? Oh, sorry. <laughs> say like how long will mothers be paid for or um, well, maybe moving on from mother work. Oh move on from other work? Yeah. So um, what's the next topic I guess? Mm. The patriarchal post patriarchal society? Yeah we have post patriarchal society, we have like feminism basically kind of like you know failing mothers. Um, well okay well do you see an importance Um, you know, I mean, I of course think that having family is more important than not having family. Um, I don't know really if we need the nuclear family as we've understood it, because that was very uh, limited and I think it burdened the father even more. It was kind of a way, the nuclear family was conceived as a way to move us out of agrarian life into industrial life, right? So when in the industrial age, you know, people like moved a lot away from their families. So you had to make your own family, little family, wherever you went seeking like work and the factory or whatever that was, right? Um, so families shrunk. So what had been kind of multi-generational, bigger, more organic families that were based, that were close to the land became the nuclear family that could be, uh, you know, moved around wherever work was, was found with migration from nation to nation, continent to continent, right? So um, I, I think that you know, creating new families would be really nice without a preconceived notion of hierarchy. That would be great. I also feel that if climate change does become a crisis, we're gonna move into more nomadic lifestyles again. Um, it's possible that we will kind of you know, migrate 
to get where the better weather, you know, seems to, to settle or get away from extreme weather conditions as they develop. So both are addiction to like, you know, wealth as we understand it now, you know, our, our houses and our homesteads and whatever will be lessened and also our kind of concept of family as we think of it now, the nuclear family will be loosened um, because w there, there is always strength in numbers and I think we will travel in groups. But if that's what's going to happen, then we're gonna eventually become migratory again. Um, and our relationship with like, you know, centralized marketplace will not be as intense as it is now. Right now, it's just a monopoly. There is like no way out. You know, if you live in, in an urban society, you really don't know how to live, how to survive if you don't make money. It's surreal. <laughs> Mm, yeah, uh, well, I do think it's troubling. I think that it's troubling that we are paying for the sexual part, but not the mother part of what, you know, nature basically has given women, especially young women, right? This kind of like power that young, beautiful women have is the work of nature. You know, you go through childhood, you're basically like, you know, more or less invisible. Then you enter puberty and your body transforms and it transforms in ways that attract, you know, people, the other the gender, men, um, for a very particular reason. And the reason is reproduction, right? So we kind of like erase that. Don't think about it anymore because now we've separated sex from reproduction and we just focus only on the sex. And then it becomes kind of like a me, 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 you know, like, we act as if uh, we ourselves, rather than Mother Nature, you know, have done this. And, um, and because we become so confused by what it is, because we have become so kind of like unclear about what, you know, beauty, sex appeal, attraction, magnetism, um, you know, pheromones, all of that, you know, are for, um, we become completely crestfallen and destroyed when we get past a certain age and that, you know, appearance is no longer there, right? But if we understood that it's not of our own making and that, you know, nature gave it to us for a, another reason, it doesn't mean that we all have to procreate by any means. What it means is that separating kind of like the ego, right, from, of, from what is not our doing and respecting nature and being, you know, humble in that sense. Um, the gifts that we have received that we do not control, we shouldn't monetize that much. So um, all of this is to say that I do find it troubling when women, especially young women, can make a lot of money uh, as in sex work or related, you know, uh, only fans, what, what not, right? Um, sex work on camera only, um, either way, rather than the same through, you know, becoming mothers, which I think is a much more uh, fulfilling and, and socially important job, and it would have more lasting benefits for them because their relationship with their children may not be as rewarding, you know, in the immediate youth, but will have kind of a lasting, you know, value, reward in their lives. And there is a lot of wisdom and learning that comes from becoming a parent, just really fast, it, you know, it just happens. So there is a lot also of like growth and maturity uh, as a human that, you know, we get. And mother nature wants us to have children young. 
I mean, it's easier on us, it's easier on our children, right? So, in, you know, our natural age and our cultural age are about 10 years apart. Like, you know, we're ready to become parents at like, you know, 14, 15, 16, but it takes another 10 years before like our prefrontal lobes are fully grown. That's because our culture is so much more complicated. We have complicated our culture so much that there is so much more to learn, right? Like in order to reproduce, there is very little needed. Nature has done pretty much, you know, the work, but culture is a lot of, uh, of complex information and knowledge that we have to be trained in so that we can fit in and then, you know, take it further. Um, and with our digital age, that's even more complicated, <laughs> more information we have to learn. Um, so yeah, I think that that tends to culturally dis disincentivize mothers from becoming, from having children young, because they want to go to school, they want to get all of their degrees, they want to start their careers. So I'm hoping that an income from motherhood, from mother work, um, will change that trend and make it an option for women who want to, for women who don't want to go to college after, or the army after high school, um, to do this work and then start their career and have their entire career ahead of them. Um, and it's more physically natural and it's also intellectually and, and emotionally maturing. Can women, can women do both? Um, I think that, you know, again, the, my idea is that for the first, um, I mean, the, the universal mother income, as I see it, is for the first six years of the child's life. Well, why six years? Because then you start first grade, and Close by the then question. the child, you know, is gone from so like the house. Over and ask the question again. Okay, yeah. For the my idea is that uh, the the mother income is paid for the first five, six years, six years of the child's life. And then the child goes to elementary school. It's in the school half the day. The child, you know, learns to read and and write and whatever. And culture kind of like takes it over. So those six years are extremely formative. And I think that, I, and I want the education that comes with the universal income to focus on all kinds of information that used to be passed down to us, information on nutrition, on child psychology, on you know, uh, mothering or on financial literacy, on you know, homemaking, cooking, all of this stuff, uh, spirituality, not only the education that we now get you know, in like a formal college or university setting. So all that stuff that's missing. Um, and then in the, you know, in, the, in the last two years of those six, the education can veer, you know, the, the mother can choose her interests and her education can veer toward accreditation degrees that can lead her into a job. So I think that um, there can be exceptions, you know, for women who want to work for, from home or something, for mothers who want to work from home. But the idea is that after those six years, the mother has a job um, of, of whatever kind, you know, a day job, and has seamlessly entered the, the, the job market with better qualifications than she would have otherwise, right? <laughs>